Well, there we go. All right. <clears throat> You're in a sweltering hot room in 1787. No, this is the Declaration of Independence. Oh, man. So this is a sweltering hot room in 1776. But yes, a sweltering hot room, as, as is July in Philadelphia. They boarded up the windows so people couldn't look in and hear what was going on in the summer. Yeah, dude. That's what I love. I, I want to get back into uh, the... A couple of years ago, there was a scholar who had concluded that Madison's notes were possibly tampered with after the fact to implicate Hamilton, right? Because the single biggest source we have on, uh, on the Constitutional Convention is Madison's notes. And that post, like later in his life, there's some possibility that he tampered with them. Does that make you feel better or worse about right now? <laughs> better. It's all an illusion. Yeah, that's kind of the problem, though, isn't it? All right, check. Okay, good. Just getting that right there. And then make sure I have my output set to external headphones. And there we go. Smoke and mirrors, all of it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, we're covering the founders in my class right now. It's fine. We did a discussion session, which I had them, uh, had them all get together and um, tell me what they knew about the founders. Uh, it, was not whole, it was not a whole lot, honestly. Some of them knew some impressive stuff, but a lot of them were like, yeah, their own money. I mean, of course, that's not, that's not bad on them. That's not bad on them. They came to college to learn. That's my job to teach them, right? And, they, and by being in the class, uh, some of them don't acknowledge it. They've implicitly said, I don't know, but I'd like to. <laughs> oh, man. All those implicit contracts we have with everyone else. No, nah, I'm not in Philly. I'm in Nashville. They just didn't do anything. You know, there's nothing going on here, really, uh, that they would paint. Although this John, John Trumbull painting is like from 1819, I think it is. It's painted well after uh, all that happened. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. I'm not seeing a whole lot of diversity. There's some short people and some taller people. That's, that's the diversity. Although I once saw like a web commercial for a developer here in East Nashville where like one of the big things is that everything's becoming homogenous in terms of race and culture. And they interviewed a resident who'd lived in the neighborhood for a while. And, uh, they were like, yeah, I'm so glad the, the, the residents, I'm so glad that they brought these houses in here because we've got diversity. I mean, we've got people, we've got people with dogs. And that was all she said. That was the two things she listed was people and people with dogs. Like who was living here before? It was like people, but also raccoons, a lot of raccoons. Dude, they're still there. They're just in the woods. How do you, let me see if I can do this. This will be so much fun if I can do this. What do oh, you yes. What is it? Um, how do I do this? Do I have to download this? Mm -hmm. All right. How do you switch your background? There you go. Did I do it? I'm in Philly too. What? I'm at Pat Stakes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants a whiz with? Dude. I'm buying. Hey, everybody, I'm buying. I want one. All right. Does it have meat, in it? It have meat in it? Because uh, I just signed something and people are going to try to kill me. Like the world's largest empire. They're all trying to murder me. So I'll take, you got something nice to eat. I'll take it. It's good to be uh, back in Philadelphia, everybody. I, I can't actually get into this thought exercise because it would imagine me being anywhere further than three miles away from my house. And uh, I'm trying to pretend like that does not exist. Yeah. Both because of, I'm longing to go somewhere else. And also because everything I hear that's happening from further than three miles away from my house, it's a little troubling recently. <laughs> hey, but you know what? I'm with you. Like, it seems to me that um, the whole world has rejoined the world, but I have not. My family has not rejoined the world. Same here. And uh, 
you just kind of I know people whose kids are in school and they've got soccer practice and playing sports and I just it, it just I mean I'm glad for them but I don't get it I don't get it hey well, and so far this is the most boring podcast ever hey Bob but I am in Philly I'm at Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and uh the best part of this is bet stadium is now a parking lot so it's great great to be back at the vet everybody yeah, yeah it's good to know that there's that there's a a, a a side of a philly stadium where the phillies have not lost a game in years you know that's right just, just that's uh right. bringing them in parking awesome okay what's that's up fun. um all right everybody <laughs> who is in the room with us i got the q a panel open up here um, so let's use that one for all the questions. And uh, you may remember a couple of episodes back, I said that like we updated it so that you can put your uh, questions in there, but also everyone can upvote them or they can tag onto the questions. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. So, so that's, that'd be the place since we're going to do Q and a tonight, that's a good place to do it. Um, anyway. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob, you want to get started off? You want to get started off? You want to, you want to see my, you want to see my three minute George Washington cherry tree bit from my, from my history classes. From my history, it's from a history class. Sure. No, you don't. It's okay. I just said sure. Okay, okay, okay. And just for all our patrons, um, this is here we go. This is this is me talking about the cherry tree in class. Here we go. Can you guys see this? Uh, So the story is that George Washington, uh, when he was a little boy, uh, his father had a favorite cherry tree. George Washington. Uh, chopped it down. His father was like, mm. he went to George Washington. Little boy George Washington. There's a little boy George Washington, a little Solomon George Washington right there, a little mon of a boy. He went to that boy and he said, his father said, George, did you chop down my favorite cherry tree? George Washington said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. Yes, I cut the tree. Twas I. And his father was like, thank you for being honest. And the moral of the story was that George Washington could not tell a lie. Yeah, say, because that's a human being, right? Who can't tell a lie, all right? They've all got religions based around him, all right? This is George Washington. This is a dude we know lived. We know that he had weird teeth. We know that he had, his teeth all fell out. He had a powder wig. This is a person we know was a human being. And you guys are like, oh, yeah, he couldn't tell a lie. It was he, RoboCop? Like, this is ridiculous, okay? It's a ridiculous story. It's not true at all. I mean, you guys knew that this was a totally made-up story. Good. For those of you guys who didn't, do you guys know the story of how it was made up? Okay, let's go through this because it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it'll demonstrate a lot of what I'm talking about. First of all, though, I'm baffled by the way that people just kind of rolled with this story for so long. Like no one really interrogated that story. Let's just like, break this down, okay? First of all, the story starts off with a grown man who has a favorite cherry tree. What kind of a nut has a favorite? I like that one. You're my favorite one. The other ones you guys know are not as good. I love this one cherry tree. That's kind of weird. This story should be about a president who survived a terribly strange father and still persevered, but it's not. We just roll with it. We're like, okay, yeah, he had a favorite cherry tree. Yeah, just the same way that I've got a favorite what patch of grass outside. Anyway, just roll with that. And then you get to the next part where you're like, he had a favorite cherry tree and George Washington chopped it down what a psycho like he was like dad that one your favorite one so which one's your favorite one dad which one's your favorite one and he's a kid who can get an axe and he goes and gets one and just chops it down and it's like yeah dad what else do you love what else do you love fuck this cherry tree like that's kind of a psycho i don't want that guy to be president what kind of prerogative is that (sighs) finally the end of the story is like his dad his dad like walks over like he doesn't know his dad's like oh like uh, hey george was it you I mean, let's remember, this is a psycho kid holding an ax and there's only like two other people around. He's like, did you do it? And he's like, yeah, I did it, dad. What else do you love? What else do you love? Like, that's not, those aren't good stories, all right? So I don't know why people just let that slide, but crazier things have happened. So anyway, where does this story come from? That's the question. It made, oh, that's the day that I, that, that's like one of the first days and it made me convinced that these online classes could be good. My students are so into it. Sure. 
the story of that is that, that it was made up to sell a biography, if you guys don't know. It was all made up to sell a biography. Ready? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm Bob Crawford. I'm Ben Sawyer. And this is the road to now. It is. Aren't you glad we followed it? Aren't you glad we got on that road and came to now? <laughs> ben, I feel like I've been away for months. I haven't talked to you in probably a month. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's funny because uh, the great thing, or like the thing is I haven't talked to you in a month. It's like I have to think about it to realize that because I've been slammed too. It's been like life has been crazy. It is just getting crazier. It is. I it mean, is. it's literally getting crazier. Friday night, we have the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. Who didn't know this was going to happen? Who didn't know this was going to happen? I mean, I, I knew she was put on gemcitabine. I'm not saying the drug right, but three weeks ago, she went in the hospital. They said she's on this chemo drug. This is the chemo drug that they give you to buy more time. Mm. Like this was going, we knew this was going to happen. We're all so shocked. But she was 87. She had cancer five times. She was just in the hospital three weeks ago, a month ago. You know, th this was, don't be shocked by this. Don't be, be, be bummed. Be sad. Mourn. Celebrate her. But don't be shocked. Right? Yeah, you know, like like the passing of all great people. Uh, be grateful they were here. Yeah, I mean, it's a big deal. The ramifications are exponential. Yeah, but Bob, I mean, I haven't really looked at the news or anything since then. Uh, but you know, it's going to be a big election this year because you know, remember, I just remember in twenty sixteen, uh, Mitch McConnell said that in that year that when you know when Scalia died. That, that they wouldn't appoint anybody. So I'm just, you know, I haven't really been following the news because there certainly couldn't be anything on that. You know, I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty cut and dry at that point. You know, people are like, but what if he changes his mind? I was like, he's, I mean, it was like just straight, he just straight up said it, right? I mean, so I'm not, it wasn't even like couch. Oh no, Bob, the way you're looking at me tells me that maybe he was full of shit. Maybe that's what I'm seeing from you right now. Uh, like Bill Clinton once said, he did it because he could. And he's doing it because, I mean, it's about power, right? This is about power. Yeah, that's, a, that's the thing I've been thinking. Like, this was what I was thinking about earlier tonight. It was like, what do you want, man? Like, what is it you want? Like, I'll, I, I don't, I, mean, I guess I don't get it, man. Judges. Get it. He wants judges. Yeah, but why? Like, what do you? Because that's his legacy. Remaking the federal judiciary is his legacy. Not for me, it's not. Well, you, of course not. You're not the Senate <laughs> Republican Senate Majority Leader. You're this guy who's telling apocryphal George Washington stories, throwing in F-bombs. No, I'm, well, just one time, you know, for effect, man, for effect, you'd be surprised, right. you know? You gotta, well, you got to keep those kids awake. It works. But, it does work. But what I'm saying, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter to him because, you know, like by the time he's in the history books, I'll be dead, you know? So he doesn't have to worry about me as a historian. That's I'm right. certainly not bringing anything like that up in my classes, that's for sure. What he'll what will happen is, I mean, because it's already happening, right? Trump's appointed more judges than anyone. I mean, that is his his legacy, probably, other than destroying the country forever and changing a democracy into a whatever it's going to become. But I mean, that's that's the if if we if we are if we remain a democracy, that will shape. It doesn't matter what law uh, a Democratic Congress passes and a Democratic president signs, it will be challenged and it will have to face a conservative judiciary at every level, at every, every level. I mean, yeah. that's the plan because conservatives have felt since the 60s, since the Burger Court uh, or the Warren Court, uh, it's the judiciary was, was very liberal. It was very progressive. And so now yeah, this is their opportunity to make it conservative. It ain't brain, it ain't, uh, it ain't rocket science, as they say. It makes yeah. perfect sense to me. I so, don't know. so let's talk about who, who the replacements may be. Okay. Right? Because it's likely that, um, 
I mean, I guess there's a chance he doesn't get to appoint, Trump doesn't get to appoint a judge, but either before the election or in the lame duck session, he's, he's probably going to get his judge. Yeah. That's right? the, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing, man. You, you would have, I, I don't know. Let's say this. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. No, I stopped it already. Ben, I, fixed it. I fixed it. Okay. You That's fixed what I said. It. Thanks, Lord. Yeah, I fixed it while okay. we were strong. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so like, I guess the thing is, what? All right. So if you think about 2016, the thing that I felt like, you know, it was like everybody was, was upset and shaken. And the thing I said was like, look, it was a strategy, man. You put, you put a Supreme Court justice like on the, you know, on the table for that year, you know, and then more people are going to turn out. And like Republicans are struggling. Why would they even, why would they even move on this before the election? Because they have a way, like there was nothing pulling like the base out this year. I mean, except for you got to get your hardcore like Trump supporters, right? But there's nothing like swaying back and forth. Suddenly, suddenly you can push all these issues that are like old school conservative issues again, like abortion or like, you know, Obamacare. Suddenly you can spotlight them because the Supreme Court gives you a forum for really hammering that home and saying everything means, you know, every, everything matters now. So why would you push it before? So you're saying they can drag this thing out? Yeah. And then you even, I mean, this is the thing with McConnell. It's like, for God's sakes, like he's, I mean, look, Mitch, if you're listening, everyone knows you're an asshole and you just did what you did. Like we, everyone knows that no one thinks that you have some kind of a difference between you, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, the, uh, the election before that, it was a slippery, like, dude, you're like ESPN when they're like, I don't know, the Rangers have a hard time winning on Thursdays in October when it's below 70 degrees and there's clouds in the sky. You're just pulling some shit out. Okay. Everyone knows you're doing that. So but why would you do it when you realize that so many people are going to see through you when you could just go, and this, this probably is worse, honestly, just go, Hey, we're not going to do it. Like we said, and then you wait to see, and you use it as an election wedge. And then after the election, if you don't win, you just go that ah, psych and you pass it through anyway. That's what I don't get. Anybody. I think that whether it's before, I guess the, I guess Ginsburg was appointed in 47 days, which is pretty quickly when she was appointed in 93 by Bill Clinton. Yeah. So we're at 46 days to the election. I mean, 45, 44. I don't know. I got to go back and do the, it's, it's close for before the election. I'm sure they'll, they may try it. Um, but even if it's, it doesn't matter. I feel like it's, it doesn't matter because they're going to do it in the lame duck session unless it can be blocked, right? Unless Biden wins and then Collins and Murkowski, maybe Romney, maybe another Republican say, well, listen, the American people have spoken, right? Especially if Biden wins in a landslide, they say, hey, the American people have spoken. They obviously don't want Trump to appoint this judge. Yeah. Otherwise, you say, if you're conservatives, if you're Republican, you say, let's ram this through. And we've got a 30 to 50 year old judge on the court that will be there. It's better than having a president. Right. What was John Adams greatest contribution? Midnight appointments, dude. Yeah. John Marshall. John Marshall was John that. Adams greatest accomplishment yeah, as, as yeah. president. Yeah. So. I think it's important for us to look at some of the leading candidates to replace Ginsburg on the court. Because I think there's one that if Trump picks her, could win him the election. Yeah, the Florida, the, the Latina from Florida. Barbara Lagoa. Yeah. Cuban-American. She's very experienced on the court. She was the former chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court, right? She was um, nominated to the two Florida's third district court of appeals by Jeb Bush. She served over a decade on that court. Then Trump nominated her to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. She's a member of the Federal Society, of course, close confident to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, but some have questioned her conservative credentials, especially on abortion. Yeah, but that's not going to matter to Trump. He's not going to care. He's going to go, can I get Florida? 
But that's what I'm saying. And she may pull moderate Republican women who were going to vote against Trump back on the Trump train. She may not look scary. She may maybe look like if you're a conservative Republican woman who doesn't love Trump, you may say, I like this woman. She doesn't scare me. I like that she's conservative. She's not crazy conservative. I feel like having her on the court will give me the country I want. Hmm. You know what I want, Bob? And I, this is like where I go back to like theoretical level. Level. It's like I want I want a constitutional amendment that is two thirds of the Senate has to vote to to support. Like I want I want a clear like non just fifty percent. Like I want two thirds because I want every Supreme Court justice to not simply be appealing to one political party or the other. Maybe that's pie in the sky. But for goodness, could we not all agree on that? Pie in the sky. Well, you know who's largely responsible for the predicament we're in today? The Democrats. Yes. Harry Reid. Yes, for changing the rules. Yes, I've reminded people of that. Yeah. It's real convenient when it looked like you were killing it. I think court packing is a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Terrible idea. Didn't work out for Roosevelt. It will be, I, I fear, as we head down the stretch, it will become as damaging to the Democrats as the slogan, defund the police. Terrible slogan. Terrible slogan. Oh, I, know what it, it, I know what it means. I know what it means for real. But the slogan, defund the police, is damaging <laughs> to the Biden campaign. Yeah. I also fear court packing will be damaging to the Biden campaign. That phrase and that being tagged him being tagged with that i don't think i think you need moderate republicans anti-trumpers to win this election through joe biden and you you don't you don't need defund the police you don't need court packing but just you got to stay away from that stuff this is these are my opinions i love the way it's like if you went over to anyone and said all right i'm going to say a phrase all right, and you tell me whether or not you think this phrase sounds positive or negative. Packing, defund. Like, God, man, the Democrats' message is terrible. They, yeah. You know what I need to do? I need to get somehow find a shorter mic stand yeah. or raise up my. Or get out your webcam that has a tripod with it that goes up higher. Does it have a tripod? Yeah. Anyway. So everyone. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Hey, don't show that too much. Those things are still like gold. It's, it's Those are still like gold on uh, on the internet now. Hunted that thing down. Anyway. Hey, guys, right now, we've been talking about a lot of things and you're like, man, this has kind of been a down episode. Well, let me just tell you, Damn. if you go to Libro.fm, audiobook company and download... Download an audio book. Use promo code RTN for, for two. You'll get two books your first month. You can download, uh, oh, let me give you, BJ Novick, his book of short stories. So good. One more thing, it'll make you really laugh. Or you can download Sarah Vowell where you can learn any of her books where you can learn about history and laugh hard. Just going to put that out there. Audio books uh, take me away right now, and it's kind of nice. What about Lindsay Shavrinsky? Lindsay Stravinsky, October 4th, 2029. What about her Eastern. book? Yes, the, the, cab the cabinet is available on Libro.fm. Bob, why would you even bring that up right now? I mean, is it because I've got like the founders behind me or is there another reason? Because she's going to be our guest yes, in a couple is. weeks, two weeks. Lindsay Stravinsky, right here on the road to now. She wrote The Cabinet, this amazing book about Washington's cabinet and the formation of an American institution. She will be here uh, October 4th, 9 p.m. Eastern time, live on Zoom. Uh, webinar with Road to Now. I'm amped because I started reading this book. I said, hey, Bob, I know you're going to like this. You want me to get in touch with Lindsay Trevinsky? And he was like, yeah, I've heard about that book. Like, and it was, it's one of those beautiful times where we, we were both so excited. So uh, yeah, go get it at Libro.fm, Lindsay Trevinsky. You can get Lindsay Trevinsky's book, The Cabinet, and get Sarah Val book, or get Lindsay Trevinsky and get, you know, whatever you want. We've got a Road to Now playlist on there where all our past authors' books are listed. 
Hey guys, friends, let's hear from you. What's on your mind? No open questions, huh? Yes, we got one, right? Uh huh. Amy, Ben, have you listened to the podcast Winds of Change? Amy, I have not yet, but I want to. Uh, I've heard about it, and it's about the, uh, the the song Winds of Change by Scorpions, right? And how like the potential like it goes through government funding, like it's somehow sponsored. I don't know the total story, but um, I'm really interested to hear about it. I have not, though, listened to it. Uh, Amy, have you? What do you think about? Is it a series or just one? It's mind blowing. It's a, it's a series, right? I'm pre- I thought it was a series. Yeah. Is that right, Amy? We need to have it where everyone's just on here talking to each other. Pull people in here. Let's hear uh, more about Ben Scorpion's fandom. Look, that's hey, about, hey, that's about I as far saw, as it goes. I saw the Scorpions. You I did? The original Monsters of Rock. At, yeah. In Philadelphia. At our um, JFK Stadium. No, but, it wasn't the vet. It was the JFK. It was like um, Metallica opened. And then it was Dokken. The Scorpions. Dude, this must have been mid The headliner was Van Halen with, with uh, Van Hagar, with Sammy Hagar. They rock. Of course they rock. They were, Scorpions were great. I had that album. There were one of their albums. Bob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some credit to Philly right now. I'm going to give you my honest response. When you tell me about a show that you went to in the past, I'm always like, man, that's awesome. And you go, it was in Philly. And I will say that that just kind of makes it a little bit more awesome when you say that. Well, that's where I went to all my concerts. Yeah, I know. But you, you always say it. And I always like a visual, I guess, because like, you know, my mom grew up around there. When I was a kid, I went up there. It just gives it some power. It's cool. Yeah, I don't so, have any Scorpions. Fan. I definitely have a fear of Scorpions. I have a fear of Scorpions, the creatures. And I think it's a reasonable fear because, uh, look, in, the, in life, you get one you either get pinchers or you get a poison tail, one or the other. It's not fair if you've got both, okay? So I just think my fear is totally reasonable because, uh, you know what, they're over-equipped. So that's my statement on Scorpion the Animal. What have you been listening to, Bob? Music-wise? I don't listen to music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those you guys listening, Bob looked at me <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> he's, he's, his nose went up and he said, music-wise? All I listen to the music of the 80s. That's all it's into is the, is the 80s. Seriously. <laughs> I'm really getting bad about that. Uh, the Jam. I've been listening to The Jam. Anybody remember The Jam? I, I've reached the age where I'm going back to um, probably the happiest time of my life, like when I was a teenager, and I'm just listening to that music. Yeah? I'm like, that's what you do when you get older. It's like you find you – find clo- that's why, like, old men, they dress a certain way, and they always wear the same thing. Because they just, they found something that they liked and they just stick with it. They don't care anymore. I'll have to try that. I'm just kidding, but. (laughs) Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates, uh, Yola Tango, um, Frank Sinatra, Chris Shiflett, who I spoke with on the Politics of Truth. He's the lead guitar player for Foo Fighters and he has uh, some great solo albums. And then the kids. The kids like Imagine Dragons. Oh, that's cool. So my kids now have a band that they like that I'm not in, but they have like, they like real, like real people music, like not kidding. Like they like kidding music. How they like kidding music. But she also likes 80s music because we got her into this TV show called The Kids Incorporated to get her off of the little kitty music. And so now so. she's all about, all about the 80s music. Bob, what is your take on the driving show? Or just... Yeah, it was, it, was, it was incredible. Yeah, no, it was really sweet. It, it worked great and no COVID cases. Uh, we were, you know, we're three weeks out now. No reported COVID cases from, that they can trace back to our show and everyone was well behaved and just beautiful. It was just great. Yeah. I heard like from various people, nothing but amazing things about that show. It was, it was really wonderful. I mean, it was like Dane told me, Alex Fang told me, like, I just kind of like independently was texting with people that were there. And it was like, and then I was reading reviews, like the Charlotte Observer review. That's what I read that. That was an amazing review. It was it's awesome, man. 
Still waiting, waiting, for, <clears throat> waiting for reviews on my history 2010, my US history one class. They haven't come in yet, but they're all raving. They're all fantastic. Uh, Bruce Springsteen's got a new song. He's got a new album coming out. I've been listening to that a little bit. Um, are we starting to talk about the music thing or should we move on to something? No, else? let's move on. I mean, I, f- I was waiting for questions to roll in. I guess, you know what? All right, all right. Oh, 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 oh my God. I have an announcement to make. How have I not brought this up yet? <laughs> hey. You guys in the room with us right now, patrons, listeners in general, anyone in this podcast, has anyone noticed that our, uh, like, aside from recording, like any engagement we've done, have you noticed that there have not been many posts? And have you noticed anything different, anybody, about like our engagement and what we've been doing with the material we produce? Anybody notice that? Has anyone noticed that? Um, <laughs> Gary Fletcher went on sabbatical for a while. And right now I feel like my mom has come back and picked me up at the gas station. I, dude, I feel, uh, oh my God, Gary's back this week. He's going to be editing this episode. And, uh, oh God. Bob. Ben, ben, you say sabbatical, but let's just be honest. Gary went to jail. Gary was in jail for, he had to serve 90 days. He's out. He says we're he didn't so, do it. So, but he, he served his time, so it doesn't matter if he did it or not. We don't judge. He's out of prison. Look, I don't care what the I don't care what they said. All right. You can get drunk off of gasoline, and if you put it in a bottle that says drunk juice, all right, then you can sell it and it's not against the law because it's it's being honest, right? No. He did not go to jail, by the way, guys. He did not go to jail. Maybe he's been hanging out over here some. We watched Naked Gun like two weeks ago. Me and him and my buddy Sean, like in the yard, I've got a big yard and we distance out and sit and watch the big screen TV that I dragged in the backyard because I'm a redneck. So we do that sometimes. Uh, yeah. So, oh man, I'm so happy to have Gary back. You guys don't even know. You don't even know. Aaron Weber edited some episodes for us too. Aaron Weber is a buddy of mine who's also a comic. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, checked out Nate Bargatze's new podcast, which is actually hilarious. Um, Nate Land. It's great but aaron is one of the guys on that podcast and uh he did us a solid and did some editing while we got back into uh teaching classes here at the house both kindergarten and university so shout out aaron weber for stepping in and helping us out with it he is amazing but gary fletcher is back <laughs> oh. anyway i'm sorry i knew as soon as that started it was gonna rejoice much to rejoice about around anyway <laughs> Ben, what else you got? Hey, Ben, no, let's talk about this. The His- History Commission. Oh, you mean the 1770 Commission for a patriotic history? You want to talk about that? 76, yes. I-, I didn't know if we'd have time to talk about this tonight. I'm, I'm glad we How do. How much time we, what time we, uh, we yeah. got? We got a little, little, little time, yeah, sure. All right, so uh, anybody see this, by the way? You tell me in the chat over there. Uh, on Thursday... The Trump administration had a uh, welcomed a panel to the White House Commission on uh, American History. Uh, you may have actually heard about this kind of somewhat because of the announcement that Trump made later in the day that he was forming a 1776 Commission on Patriotic History, which is, I mean, quite frankly, guys like me forming a panel on nuclear physics. I don't know anything about it. Yet, uh, I'm confident when I talk about it in its history. I don't know. Not, not really. Actually, I know better. Um, but what a lot of people missed was that earlier that day, they kind of showed their hand about what it was they were trying to do. And this is ostensibly to battle the 1619 Project, this, 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 oh, which apparently is just the, that's everybody's textbooks now, which is not. Uh, textbooks are still basically written by a couple of states and then hawked on the students of the country. Uh, just a reminder, the most recent textbook cited Moses is one of the most influential factors on the founding fathers, which no one's saying faith didn't matter to him. It's just weird to single out Moses. That's all I'm saying. But anyway, so what happened with the White House uh, a, a Conference on American History was they invited a panel of people to speak at the White House, and it was a circus for the first part of it, there were a couple of actually like good historians on there. Like, I mean, like maybe one or two, like they said really, they said good things, but that's not the reason they were there. I guess they had to get some names. What they didn't have to get was anybody but white people because they put Ben Carson up there in the middle of it, right in the middle of it. He has no clue. In fact, he seemed to have questioned the media. 
He said, we shouldn't tamper with the Constitution, which, as I like to call it, is amending the Constitution and uh, needs to be done from time to time. And he also called the U.S. an empire to wrap up this conference. So a lot of really gold coming out of Ben Carson's uh, you know, mouth during this. Uh, not that kind of doctor. I'm glad I could say that for someone else. So anyway, you break it down. Who are these people? The first person who spoke, uh, and I, let me just get my notes out here, Bob. I didn't expect and to do this. There were a few. So Hillsdale College, yes. right? And that's in Michigan. Yes, it is. And it, it was established in 1844 by free will Baptist abolitionists. Right. The religious right back in those days. Yes. And... The funny thing is, was it the day before this or the day after this was Constitution Day? It was the same day. It was Thursday, wasn't it? It was the same day. So at the same so. time, these Hills, Hillsdale history professors were at the White House or wherever they were at this uh, 1776 conference. William Barr, the attorney general, was at Hillsdale College giving a speech. And this is the speech where he said, and I quote, putting a national lockdown, stay-at-home orders is like house arrest. First of all, we didn't have a national lockdown. Yeah. We had states had lockdowns, put lockdowns in place uh, in certain counties, certain states, whatever, but we didn't have a national lockdown. William Barr also said, other than slavery, which was a different kind of restraint, this is the greatest intrusion on civil liberties in American history. Yeah. So, so staying at home... So you don't give the virus to someone like your grandparents or your parents or medically fragile children like mine. That's kind of like slavery. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's, and that's, that's a whole set of problems right there. Right. And this was the thing, this is, uh, I mean, like, dude, do we not, we know what Barr's up to. We know what Trump's up to. We, we know the evidence doesn't lead them. We know what they can I say one, one more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause th this is kind of of a, a, a trinity, a trinity, if you will, of William <laughs> Barr comments. Uh, a person, this is all within the same 25 seconds he said these things. A person in a white coat is not the grand seer who can come up with the right decision for society. A free people makes its decisions through its elected representative. So what he's saying is, when you're in a pandemic, the doctor isn't the person, when the scientist that's not the person who should give us the advice by which we deal with the situation. It's your elected representative who most likely is not a doctor. And even if they are, they should have been busy enough being commander in chief not to have been able to keep up on the latest medical research as an expert has to, because experts have to spend all their time keeping up on things, especially when it comes to medicine. You know, this is, but, you know, hey, let's go with what we feel in our heart of hearts. And I've always said whoever, whoever makes political decisions based on what they feel in their heart of hearts deserves to be punched in their face of faces. But let's move on to these panelists here, because this is what I was getting at. And this was, was what I wanted to, to really like dig into, because this didn't get the hype, because it wasn't Trump making some announcement where he got a huge round of applause. It wasn't Barr. It was the actual people that, that they decided to come up there and put uh, and basically put them as the face of this new project. Let me just break this down to you. I will do a rundown of the panelists, okay? First of all, you're right. Three of them are affiliated with Hillsdale College. There were nine total speakers, three of them from Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College, if you don't know, uh, Hillsdale College is, uh, they were so against affirmative action that they, in fact, stopped taking federal funding to have to be able to, to be able to go around it. And then when the state of Michigan came in and said anything to them about it, they then just stopped taking funding from the state of Michigan because they've got a lot of wealthy donors. Uh, upon the end of that, the president of Hillsdale College said uh, in, in a conversation, uh, speaking to the state, he said uh, he thought it might have been, quote, because we didn't have enough of the brown ones. Let me get that, that quote exactly right. Yeah, it's, uh, the, he said the brown ones, right? He said we don't have enough of the brown ones, quote, brown ones. Okay. The president of Hillsdale College who said that, uh, what I think is a pretty clearly, uh, if not intentionally racist, nevertheless, I don't care about this issue. That president was named uh, Larry Arn. He was actually also the moderator for this panel of the White House Conference on American Historians. The first speaker was Dr. Mary Graver, who has a PhD in English and just hates Howard Zinn. Like she just hates Howard Zinn. 
And I will tell you this, the way that actual experts work is they don't go, no, uh, like you, like any, anybody who writes a book and goes, no, uh, Karl Marx or no, uh, Adam Smith, that's not a real scholar because they actually write and they, and they prove with evidence. And that's what rebuts. You don't have to go, no, uh, I told you, you don't have to do that if you're a real scholar. So that's the first one. Second one, Dr. Peter Wood, who said that radicals are led by malice and that radical professors and colleges are to blame. Uh, Dr. Peter Wood's credentials are he has a PhD in anthropology. He was most, uh, his most recent public appearance before this was in 2011 when he came out and tried to uh, bolster the claims against climate change and say that wasn't real. And I guess he scurried back into his burrow and they pulled him back out for this one. Uh, he's very angry. Uh, do, then, then you have Dr. Alan Guelzo, who is, he sounds like a 1930s radio show, but pretty amazing speaker and a legit scholar, but he just kind of told a story. You move on to, after that, Miss Victoria Espiato, who is just a fifth-year college student at University of Virginia who is in Young Americans for Freedom. Okay, cool. Seems smart, whatever. Uh, then you get into the heart of it. Bill McClay, who's a historian, who is going to Hillsdale College. Uh, then Mr. Ted Rebarber, who is developing a curriculum built around a book by McClay for his charter school system that he plans to pitch out as a patriotic history. So you have a business person in here that has direct ties to them. Then Dr. Robert Jackson, who is also a, a part of a founder, a, a founder and an administrator for a series of charter schools. Then finally, Mr. Jordan Adams, who is Associate Director of Instructional Resources at Hillsdale, who is part of the liaison team for Hillsdale College to their charter schools that they've set up all over the country. Do you guys, and that's very quick, but do you get that there might be a couple of themes here? Dude, experts tell you things you don't want to hear. You don't like it? Does it make you feel bad? Cool, because the private sector will sell you whatever you want to hear. We're going to outsource this stuff. Go to, your, go to a charter school. Patriotic history. Dude, historians ask questions, propagandists give, give answers. There's no investigation. That's that. Was that fast enough, Bob? I can't hear you. You're muted. To, uh, to be respectful and unmute myself. Was that fast uh, enough? It was great. That was w well done and succinct. Thank you. Is that right? Succinct? I don't know. No one's ever said that to me before. So, mm. uh, <laughs> We have two questions here I'd like to get to before we, uh, before we end tonight's conversation. Uh, Matt Ensley. Welcome back. Welcome back, Matt. What does Biden need to do to win the first debate on the 29th? Same for Trump. Well, I think Biden needs to be careful because Trump's just going to say stuff, right? <laughs> He's going to say stuff and none of it's going to be true. He's just going to say things and Biden's got to be careful to not fact check him. Be just to be fact checking him all night because you know, the moderator, their job is not to fact check. I mean, they're supposed to, they're told not to fact check. That is for the, the other debater. That's the whole thing about the, the debate is they challenge each other on what they say. So um, Biden needs to be careful to not get that bogged down in fact checking Trump, which is what we're always doing, right? And what the media always does. That's why things are so messed up probably. So I think Biden, he needs to be, I don't know if anybody watched the uh, town hall meeting with Biden on Thursday night. Um, it was excellent. He was amazing. He was working class Joe. He was tough. He, he needs to be working class Joe. He needs to take back the working class mantle from Trump. All those working class whites, white men voted for Trump and Biden needs, the way Biden was the other night, he, he completely, um, uh, um, was able to claim that, claim that mantle back. And I'd like to see that Biden, you know, just uh, really compassionate, um, stick, hammer home healthcare, hammer, hammer home the fact that the, one of the important things about what we're, what we're dealing with with the Supreme Court situation is that the appellate court in Texas struck down Obamacare and the oral, oral arguments before the Supreme Court will be a week after the election. So if you have an eight person Supreme Court and Roberts votes with the liberals, you, and it's four to four, Obamacare is gone. 
because it, it'll go back to the appellate court decision. So Biden needs to emphasize you're going to lose your pre-existing condition, uh, your pre- pre-existing condition waiver. Um, you're going to lose all of that. So we need a Democratic president. We need a Democratic Senate so we can ha- essentially pass Obamacare again and make it better because it's gone. Obamacare is gone no matter what. Do you guys remember 2016? Do you remember the, the debates? How do you remember them? Because, because here's the thing. And the first one, Hillary Clinton did a much better job. Killed him. It was the first one, right? Second one was, the, was two days after the Access Hollywood and rather than drop out of the race, Trump got Bill Clinton's accusers and put them in the front row, had a press conference with them right an hour before the debate and then put them in the audience. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. This is my read of it, right? Hillary Clinton is not very good on her toes. She's just not, right? Whatever you want to say about her, she's not, she's not really a charismatic speaker in the traditional sense that she's not quick. Right. I mean, I mean, this is my objective. It has nothing to do right with, with, with like my sentiment about her individually, like, but they must've locked her in a room and just prepared her to talk about like three or four things the entire time. And was like, if he says this, then this, if he says this and this, and, and she like, she's a good student, right? Like she's intelligent. And so that's what she did. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a political advisor, but if I were uh, anybody coaching Biden, I would say you, here's the three things you will ever talk about at these debates. That's it. Whatever Trump says, if it comes back to you, you just go, Hey, and you talk about something else, right? Because Trump's power isn't getting you worked up. As soon as he got her out on her heels with those accusers, man, suddenly he feels the energy. But if you just ignore him and talk and just basically do not acknowledge he responds to anything, he's also a child. You know, if Solomon wants something and, uh, he, you know, we don't, we go, no, or we don't hear him, he starts throwing stuff across the room, right? And then you see what a five-year-old he is. Just talk about three things. That'd be my advice, but I'm also not a political advisor. I'm a podcaster. Dale Martin asks, do you think social media is compatible with democracy? People seem all too happy to spread misinformation. They usually preface it with, I don't know if this is real, but Dale, I believe like Roger McNamee uh, last month when we had him on, that the problem in this country is not, I mean, Trump is a problem, but I believe Facebook is, is is a worse problem and we probably have Trump because of Facebook. And we didn't talk about QAnon tonight, but that is, you know, it's like this. It's like what Ben said about history. You know, historians ask questions, propagandists give you answers. Well, with Trump, he doesn't fit into the Christian faith, right? So they're essentially QAnon is creating a faith around Trump to, suit, Bob. to fit him. I mean, that's what's happening here. That's why evangelicals are flocking to QAnon. It is, it is the, the, you know, it's just like how the Nazis changed Christianity to suit Hitler. And that's what's happening with QAnon. And that is a great fear of mine. Um, and the way uh, I listen to a podcast, Christianity Today, podcast called quick to listen and it was about QAnon and evangelicals and it scared the hell out of me i mean QAnon, they're popping up on like peloton it's like peloton message boards like fitness message boards like QAnon. it's spreading it's spreading rapidly through the pandemic right it makes sense that in a pandemic that something like conspiracy theories would spread i mean but that's what's happening and and uh, I don't know if, if you all at home have seen it in your life, but I've seen it uh, in people I know. And I don't know about you, Ben, but, but it is something that we're not all talking about. It's not um, in all the headlines, but you do have a few congressional candidates, Republicans who are QAnon believers who have been, uh, who, who, will, who will win, elect, elect they, they, will, <laughs> they will have a seat in Congress in 2021. So I, this this something this is we're at the beginning of this, and it's really bad. And Facebook is the problem. Well, it's not just the problem; it's exploiting us. But what I'll say is, I will now I will cite Joe Rogan as having the single best response to QAnon I have ever heard, which was, "So you're ta- you you're telling me that Donald Trump is doing one thing, right?" 
all the things he brags about he didn't do. You tell me that Donald Trump is doing one thing we would all agree, saving these children and saving, you know, bring us to the light. He's doing that one thing we would actually agree on. It would be the most heroic thing of his life. And that's the one thing he's just chosen not to talk about. Uh, shout out Joe Rogan. I wish I want, I, you know what? I want him to moderate a debate. I agree. I heard, I read that somebody brought that up this week and I, I think that's a great idea. And Brown Betts, have either of you read the book Arguing About Slavery, John Quincy Adams and The Great Battle in the United States Congress? No, I've seen this book, but I have not read it by William Lee Miller. And or what are some of your thoughts? I love John Quincy Adams. He is he's like uh, Martin Van Buren. He's one of my favorite presidents. I think Adams is interesting in that like he he seems to like, you know, the general, the general idea is that he's the, he's not, he's the first of the non-founders who's the president. And, but he's from the, from the Adams family and the Adams family sounded weird, but he's like from that family. And so like he, he comes in, he comes in and he's playing the old games and he loses right to Jackson. But then he seems to come around and really, cause he's smart. He also spoke he, Russian by the way. He, was he on goes the court to Congress. He loses the presidency and he runs for Congress. And there he is. He literally dies in Congress, on the floor of Congress. I mean, I, it's just great. He becomes this champion of uh, abolitionism and, uh, and against the Mexican War. So he, yeah, he's an amazing figure. In fact, I have a book, I don't know who wrote it, The President Who Wouldn't Retire. And it's all about his uh, JQA's time in Congress. Yeah, we should have him on the podcast, Bob. It'd be great. Yeah. It'd be great. Bob. Yeah. You need to wrap up, yeah? Yeah, 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 I do. I do. All right, before we go, <laughs> no, but before we go, like, look. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We had other, something else we had to talk about. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, you know, uh, and this is sincere. This week was stressful as could be for me. It was like I did like a Fulbright committee meeting. I was mentoring a student through a legislative internship, like all these things I did. I hosted trivia for the National Conference of State Legislators this week, which shout out to Tim Story. That was so much fun. I love working with those guys. It was a crazy week. And I was like, oh, it's one of those feelings where you're like, everything's compressed, you know? And then I got a text from Jamie Jeschke, like it was to me, you and Chris Breslin. And he was like, hey, just, uh, just, just made some fresh coffee. Would you guys want me to send you some? It was very nice. It yes. was, Jamie, if you're listening, literally like you know how sometimes just an act of kindness will like it just you just go oh yeah there is there is something outside of all the things that have got me like kind of compressed uh so you know this week would be the worst week to forget to tell everybody to go to lacosechacoffee.com right bob just feel like this microphone it's just it's just there it is there. As far as yes. like, it's not here. It's not here. <laughs> of course, you should go to lacosecha.com and you should support Jamie. He's a good friend of ours. It's great coffee, you know, and, and isn't it nice to get things? Who, who is, ra raise your hands, who is doing their shopping on, on the computer? I mean, I'm doing most of my grocery shopping is online. We're having stuff shipped in still. I'm still doing this. So, I mean, wouldn't it be nice, you know, and it's nice to get, get things in the mail. So a pound of coffee is a wonderful thing to get in the mail. And you're supporting Jamie. And you're supporting our sponsor. Like and it's great coffee. Us. Yeah. And dude, it is, I don't know about you guys, but in Nashville this weekend, like in the last few days, it's finally felt like fall. And it's like, you know, it's like a couple times a summer. I, I thought you guys, I don't drink coffee that often. When I drink it, it's like I said, your coffee just because I like it. And now it's like it turned cold and I was like, uh, not cold, but, you know, fall time. And I was just feeling like, oh, man, this is like the perfect time. I feel like there's a bullseye on a map to hit to send me a pound of coffee to get a good pound of coffee right now uh, is it. So go to lacosechacoffee.com, uh, enter promo code RTN10. That's RTN, the number 10. I'm telling you, like, Bob, we have sent this coffee to our guests on the show. And, you know, like with Jason Stark sent us like the best email. He was like, I just like, it was like a week after we told him we were sending it to him. And he was like, this coffee is so good. And uh, by the way, I believe anything Jason Stark says. The man is an angel. He's but, there. He's at the vet right now. There, there he is over there. <laughs> he's right. First baseline. He's, he's got seats right there. 
Yeah. yeah, he made it out of the closet underneath there. Long story. You have to go back <laughs> and listen to the Jason Stark episode and, yeah, on the history of right. baseball. But yeah, so so go to La Cosecha. Like we right now, we need our small businesses to have our support. And uh, yeah, I can't even say it. Like it's it's weird because we only have sponsors, Bob. That I like that I love, and I don't know if people are like, man, he's really putting it on. But it's like, no, no, no. We've been working with these guys for years, and I love what they do. And we hope you go to La Cosecha, uh, LaCosechaCoffee.com. RTN 10 and we'll uh, hopefully you'll be drinking some good coffee soon. Get yourself all amped up like me. I feel like Sam sitting here with his microphone. You, so you have, the, you, you, you seem to be like portraying the, the, the look you're exuding the look of a man who. <laughs> I just feel like I'm anybody sorry. who's any of our patrons who is, uh, who is listening to this, go back and, and skip to this part of the episode and see what Bob looks like on this video. It's appropriate. It should be like that. That's probably how it should be. Or you can just stand up. You build yourself. You know what a, I'll, I'll do? I'm going to get a, a redneck desk like I did out of a particle board. I'm going to get a phone book. And I'm going to sit on the phone book. <laughs> hey, Bob's like, I'll get a phone book. Yeah. Good luck. And then I'll go out and get myself a horse and carriage and I'll ride it around town. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'll, I'm going to get me a rotary telephone. I'm going <laughs> to. I keep on pushing two buttons at one time. Can you get me one of them ones that hangs on the wall? Got to bolt it in with some long bolts and a hammer drill. <laughs> the kind that your elbow blows out using by the time you're 33, you know, but it doesn't matter because it's 1940. And you're not going to live much longer anyway. Our phone was in the kitchen. Like we had one phone. It was in the, on the wall in the kitchen, the dial, the dial phone. Yeah, I was born in 71. Um, and my mom would sit there and she would put a chair from the kitchen table and sit in the kitchen, talk and talk on the phone. Get one of them long cords, man. We have one of them long cords. Reach all the way from the kitchen upstairs, downstairs to my bedroom. I go in there, pull the door shut real hard just to clip it in there. Talk about nothing at all scandalous, you know, just being in middle school. Yeah. Well, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I, I hope this was okay. Right. You know, I hope it was okay. I'm glad I don't. you're all here. I don't. I mean, look, Bob, our real I mean, you're listeners. You're still here. Our you're real listeners here. will decode all the predictions we've just made from this episode. Hey, They'll put Dale, it together on HN and Dale, but uh Dale said all the predictions that the QAnon that don't come true, but people don't care. That's the whole that's conspiracy theory, right? It doesn't matter. Oh, it didn't come true because of this and because of that. And yeah, how many yes, people? Mary, we are going to have a election, post-election debrief. We're working on somebody to come on. A, you know, maybe we should get those guests on after the election rather than before the election. Because sure, last time we had them on right before the election and, you know, th things were crazy. I, I, I almost feel like we should ask them to come on the, sun, the Sunday after the election, which I bet will still be counting the votes. And Trump will have declared himself the winner, even though all the votes aren't counted. It's been crazy. You guys think 2020 has been crazy? It, hey, and listen, I'm not being negative, Ben. No. I'm, not being negative. I'm, a, I'm a realist. George, every book I've ever read about George Washington, what do they say? He was a realist. He saw the world as it was, not as he, wa not as he wanted it to be. And I just feel like I, I'm seeing the world as it is, not as I want it to be. And I, you know, I'm not, don't feel like I'm being negative or I'm, a, I'm not a downer. I'm just telling you all, you ain't seen nothing yet. I also love that Trump has in North Carolina encouraged people to co like potentially commit a felony by voting twice. In North Carolina, which will, uh, I believe in North Carolina, well, right now it's, way, uh, it's changed, but it's awaiting, it was awaiting a final decision. But in North Carolina, he's encouraging all his voters to potentially do something that will make them ineligible to vote in the upcoming elections, which tells you everything you need to know about, about what his strategy is. He goes, I've only got to win one more. Who cares? North Carolina, this is the last thing I do have to go. Um, they've done a great job with the absentee ballots, getting them out early. They've already had over 100,000 come back. You can track your ballot online. So, uh, so almost a million absentee ballots went out. 900 and some thousand went out. I follow this guy, Michael Bitzer. 
on uh, on Twitter. I'll have to uh, get his his handle for you all. But he 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 found, he's an expert in North Carolina politics. He's constantly posting the numbers. Okay, so first of all, if you have an absentee ballot in North Carolina, you can mail in your ballot. When you mail in your ballot, you can track it online. So they've already had out of nine hundred and seventy thousand some absentee ballots requested, uh, 110,000, something like that, have been returned and logged already. And they can, so they're counting those votes as they come in. So you're not going to have the situation in North Carolina like you're going to have in Michigan. Michigan's already said, we're not going to have the vote total for three or four days afterwards, which is terrible because that's going to give Trump an incredible opening if it's a close, close election to declare a victory. Biden's got to win Arizona. Biden's got to wear, God, if he can wear, win Texas or Georgia or Ohio or Iowa, he needs to be able to win on election night without any of these mail-in ballot states. The Pennsylvania, they're going to have issues as well. I've heard a lot of people being concerned that they're going to throw out Trump voters uh, certificates in North Carolina, you know, like they, they, people, the conspiratorial thinking is so insane because like I've seen people from back in Cabarrus County saying, you know, because what Trump said was vote by mail and then go down to the poll to see if they've counted your, to count your ballot, which is psycho. Cause why would you vote before if you were just gonna go down there anyway? But people were like, just to make sure my ballot's going to count. So I actually pointed them directly to the Cabarrus County voter commission where they could actually go to a meeting. And then I told them you can actually be a poll worker so you can observe it yourself and serve your community while you make sure it's not happening. And they were like, I'm too busy. It was like, well, you can spend some of that time. You're posting conspiracy theories on it, but I want to end on this. I want to end on this. Okay. For those of you guys who were worried and go, did my vote count? All right. Here's one way you can know every, if every single person who wants to know if they voted, it's a Trump voter, right? Make sure it counts. Write my name in, Ben Sawyer as governor of North Carolina, all right? And if that way we'll know if the same number of votes that go for Trump go for Ben Sawyer, then we'll know for sure that your ballot was counted, all right? I'll see you. Look forward to seeing you guys at the inauguration. But I, in I don't want you to take away votes from Roy Cooper. Well, last year he's taking votes away from me, Bob. I'm just kidding, obviously. I was, I was proposing a, a solution as stupid as the question. That's what I was trying to do. Well, you need to stick with historians who ask questions, not propagandists who give answers. That's right. Look what happens when we try. Look what happens when we try. We're not even good at it. All right, everybody. Well, it's been a wonderful Sunday evening. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. That's right. We'll talk to you guys on October 4th. See you guys on October 4th for our conversation with Lindsay Stravinsky. Side note, it's also do my Do not birthday. miss that. By the way, do not miss that. It's Tell it's my, your friends. Tell your friends Everyone. and... Tell them it's my birthday party, too, because it's my birthday. That's what I'm getting for my birthday this year. That will be a much more exciting conversation than this one tonight. I don't know how it could be, but talk to you guys then. Good night. Boy, Bob had his finger on that trigger, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> ah, good night to everybody. Good night to everybody.